from the world of politics. Yeah, this is certainly walking on a political tightrope for President Biden, for Speaker Pelosi, and Majority Leader Schumer. To the world of business. It's a remarkable demonstration of the strength and resilience of the banking system. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Infrastructure Week turned into Infrastructure Weekend as the White House fought to get the bipartisan deal back on track after Republicans balked at the president's suggestion it might be tied to his getting the rest of what he wants and which Republicans had objected to. On the economic consequences of all this, we welcome now Adam Posen. He is president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. It's always a treat to have you with us, Adam. First of all, give us your economic analysis. We have two components now to this infrastructure. Some people call it hard, some people call it soft. What is the economic significance of these two components? Thank you so much, David. And I love being a balance of power. There's so much going on with the infrastructure. Uh, the week was worth waiting for after years of waiting for infrastructure week. The distinction between hard and soft is not really a fair one because what ultimately infrastructure is about is long-term investments by the public in the economy to have longer-term spillovers and benefits for economic growth. And so, yes, strictly in a dictionary sense, you can say infrastructure means physical objects like roads and trains. But realistically, the issue is between things that you know are going to have a payoff and things that are not, and things that are open to everybody and things that are not. And so as long as it fits into the long-term payoff open to everybody camp, you should probably consider it infrastructure. So some of the things the American Family Plan, as it's called, are including such as investments in community college, investments in worker retraining, investments in childcare, you could argue those are a form of infrastructure. The main point is they're good investments. So, so as you say, the payoff is the question, and this is a strained analogy, I apologize, but in a business, when you make a decision on a capital investment, you take a look at the payout. What's it likely to re redeem right. for you? And you invest if you, it's going to make you more money in the long run. Uh, do these two components, hard, soft, whether fair or not, do they have likely a similar return on investment, if I can put it that way? I think the answer is no, but this is the big difference between a business investment decision and a government investment decision. Business investment decision ultimately is about revenue. It's about how much net profit you take away. Government, there are multiple goals at any one time. And so it may be important for certain political priorities or ethical priorities or distributional priorities to say, we need a boom, a support that gives more to workers than we used to have in the past going to workers. And so it's not quite fair to say, do they have the same return or not? The other point is it varies not by hard and soft, it varies very specifically by what you do. So, you know, there are things amidst the tragedy of that we've all seen unfold in Miami, obviously dealing with encroaching seas and building infrastructure is really important. On the other hand, building basketball courts or, or five-lane highways in the middle of the country may not be so important. Similarly, on human capital, we know that investments at very young ages in education have huge returns. Nobel laureate James Hackman, among others, has documented this. But we also know that throwing more money into the present high school system doesn't necessarily get you anything. So I'm afraid that the hard, soft distinction doesn't do the job for telling us what's high or low return. Uh, let me ask you a, perhaps an unfair question. Does it do the job in Washington? We have a viewer writing in right now saying, do you think that as a practical matter, the president will ever get that second component or is he going to have to just settle for the first? Now, I understand you're an economist, you're not a politician, but you do know Washington quite well. Is it harder to get that second part through politically? Absolutely. It's harder to get that second part through politically because the way our Senate is set up, and you know, this like everything else the Biden administration is dealing with, the, the, the bar you need 60 senators rather than 51 to pass most major legislation just makes everything difficult. Um, now, is it justified that it should be this difficult? 
because the amount of money involved includes pay fors and is mostly investment? I don't think so. I think on the merits, not the politics, this bill should go through largely. I think it's a far better bill, for example, than the American Rescue Plan passed in January. Now, some will say, because we spent the money on the American Rescue Plan, therefore we don't have the money for the so-called American Family Plan. But that's not really how it works. Even if you wasted money back then, as long as these investments, uh, the portfolio of investments are net present value positive, you still want to do them. Yeah. But realistically, no, I think I, I'm hoping Biden gets some of it, but he's going to get a fraction of it at most. Yeah. It sounds like a Washington version of the sunk cost fallacy. <laughs> the fact that you spent well, the money exactly. before. Well, exactly. No, no, you're absolutely right, David. That's what it is. <laughs> I mean, so you're playing this repeated game, and people like the Peterson Foundation, our cousins, we're independent of, but, you know, they're very concerned about the fiscal trajectory. And their worry is if you do sunk cost, sunk cost, sunk cost, it goes up without limit. And there's some merit to that. But the bottom line is if, if you've got investments that will have really direct positive benefits, it's foolish not to make them when the interest rates are this low. So Adam, let me turn to something that you have had so much experience with, both here in the United States and over in England, and that is monetary policy. We had sort of an unusual round trip, I would call, over the last couple of weeks, where uh, uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell came out and said, boy, we're concerned about inflation. The markets really reacted. Then he came back to Congress and said a version of the same thing. He said, but it's not right away. And they came right back again. But at some point, Adam, I'm assuming we're going to have to start taking away some of this extraordinary monetary stimulus. And by the way, it's not just the United States. It's also over in Europe. It's in UK and in Japan. Are the markets going to be able to be prepared to deal with that? Or is that necessarily going to be disruptive? That's a huge question. And it's as much for the Treasury as for the Fed or the debt issuers around the world as for the central banks, David. Because what really will cause disruption is if we have the kinds of abrupt shifts and lockups in financial markets we had a year ago, March or April, uh, that we had in oh, 2008. Now, there are things you can do about it to make that less likely. This is the unglamorous part of treasury markets, what's called the plumbing. Um, and you can, there, the new undersecretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance, Nellie Lang, is leading work on this. And so one can hope that you make it less disruptive. Another piece that I think makes it less disruptive when they withdraw monetary stimulus is the fact that the banking system is very well capitalized, is very good on liquidity. We've seen the banking system go through a couple stress tests in, in reality over the last year and come through them very well, the core U.S. banking system. So I'm a little less worried about it being disruptive. But there are, of course, a huge number of financing uh, and bad investments and questionable investments out there being made by non-banks. And there is also now a drumbeat of prices, prices rising in residential real estate. And that latter point is what really worries me. I mean, it may be that this is just a temporary bottleneck on real estate like we've seen with timber or other things. But generally, a real estate bubble is the worst thing you can have. A residential real estate bubble is the worst thing you have. You can usually shrug off other bubbles. But a, a big run-up in residential real estate prices is almost always dangerous. So I, I saw you quoted, Adam, in the Financial Times on that very subject, whether it's a bubble or not, certainly the boom in housing and some concern. By the way, it's not just limited to the United States. Is the best solution that for the, the Fed to move sooner rather than later toward tapering and ultimately raising rates? Or is the Fed really equipped to take some of the air out of the bubbles? It's a problem, in my view, David, that the Fed is less well equipped than, say, the Bank of England or the European Central Bank and some other central banks to take the air out of the bubble. Because what you want to do is something to reduce the amount of leverage and reduce the amount of speculation specifically in real estate. And if you take the punch bowl away, you are getting every sector of the economy at once, which you may not necessarily want to do. Um, so there was this development after 2008-9 of what were called macro prudential tools for central banks, which included things like limiting how much people could borrow on the value of a house? Did you have to put down a 5% for the mortgage or 20%? There's a lot of regulatory things that if not the Fed, somebody else in the US should be doing to puncture the housing bubble. And if there is one. 
Um, and that would be my inclination is to expand on that horizon rather than rush monetary tightening. Okay, Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics is sticking with us. Next, we're gonna talk about China in the next block. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. From Bloomberg Personal News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. U.S. airstrikes on Iran-backed militias in Iraq and Syria show the Biden administration won't hesitate to protect its interests in the region. That from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Rome today, who said the raids were a, quote, necessary, appropriate, and deliberate action aimed at limiting the risk of escalation. The raids have injected new uncertainty into diplomacy over Iran's nuclear program. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell wants infrastructure cut from President Biden's fast-track spending bill. He's demanding that the president pressure Democratic congressional leaders to follow him in separating a bipartisan $579 billion infrastructure plan from a larger tax and spending bill. Leader McConnell wants to head off an effort by Democratic leaders to use a fast-track budget process to pass a bill with trillions in spending and tax hikes on the wealthy. The UK is reporting a setback in its fight against the coronavirus pandemic. The country reported nearly 23,000 new COVID-19 cases today, the most since January. More than 84% of adults in the UK have had one vaccine and nearly 62% of adults are fully vaccinated. The last and only foreign scientist in the Wuhan lab is speaking out to Bloomberg. Danielle Anderson was working at what has become the world's most notorious lab just weeks before the first known cases of COVID emerged in central China. The Australian virologist wonders if she missed something. And there was no chatter of anything. Um, scientists are gossipy um, and excited. So, yeah, nothing strange from my point of view going on at that point that, that would make you think, oh, something's going on here. There's been speculation that the virus leaked from the Wuhan lab. The U.S. has questioned whether the facility was safe. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute has remained with us as we turn from the domestic back and forth over infrastructure to the international economic relationships that will affect the U.S. and global economies more than any other over the coming years, and that is, of course, those with China. Thank you, Adam, for staying with us here. We've got the 100th anniversary of the, the Communist Party in China coming up this week. It is a story I think that we've never seen in history before, a country coming back this far, this fast, economically. What does it mean for the United States? It's incredible, David. It is the most impressive and, and ethically significant economic development in human history, uh, except maybe the first industrial revolution. That China accomplished so much since 1949, but really only since 1979, because after Mao, they kept putting themselves backwards. What does this mean for the U.S.? Well, it, it's partly the U.S.'s own problems. The, uh, the story started in Washington that the U.S. messed up by not demanding enough of China before entering the WTO, or that the U.S. messed up by not being tough enough with China. That, I think, is a mistaken narrative. Um, what I think the U.S. messed up was we were already withdrawing from the world and therefore not in a position to manage China's rise. Um, I also think an issue has been and will be that uh, China is better able to keep its politics coherent than any other large country has managed to do. Now, you can say, oh, that's easy because they're an autocracy. And of course, they are an autocracy. But there are a lot of autocracies that are not as adept um, and are not able to unify the people quite so much. And so in the end, the strength of China to me is as much about them getting 
96% or whatever of the Chinese population to believe they're all one Han Chinese people um, and not have all these regional divisions that were historically very important in China. So ultimately, um, the US and the rest of the world have a very, very strong, very unified China to fight or not to fight, to contend with, I should say. Um, and the best strategy is going to be letting China overstep, letting the Chinese Communist Party leadership, which you have on your screen there, letting them make the mistakes, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali rope dope strategy, as it were. Now, there's risks to that, but recent research from Peterson Institute suggests that the efficacy of sanctions and a lot of the other things U.S. government claims to want to do aren't, isn't going to be very high. We'll address that. I know you have a study out on particularly some of the sanctions involving the Uyghur people out in the west of China. I, I wonder if the United States is unified just between the government and business, because sometimes it feels like corporations are eager to understandably tap into the huge markets in China, uh, even though the United States government is trying to hold back. Is there a tension there? Oh, there's absolutely a tension there, and you're right to spot it, David. And this is been an ongoing thing. This was true with Nazi Germany in the 30s. This was true to a much lesser degree, though, with the Soviet Union. This is always the case. Uh, the business sees opportunities. But the ability to deter U.S. business from going into places it doesn't want, it, the government doesn't want to go, is reasonably high. Um, and in fact, some of the shift of being more suspicious or hostile of China in Washington reflects how American business has gotten more suspicious and hostile towards China. Um, but the ability to keep out business from the rest of the world, from Europe, from Japan, from Korea, from Russia, uh, from wanting to do things in China is much harder. And that gets us back into these sanctions questions. People talk a lot, and President Biden, Secretary Blinken talk a lot about the U.S. leading an alliance that stands up to China. But it's very hard to do that. It's, it's, it's a great ideal, but it's not easy to deliver. Adam, let me ask a heretical question. Is it possible that since 1949 or since 1979, as you say, under Deng Xiaoping, China has moved in some ways close to the United States in terms of having more free enterprise, certainly more commerce that they're permitting, a growing middle class? Has the United States, particularly in recent years, moved more toward China, as we see the government playing a much larger role in, com in, the, in commerce than we've seen before? We really are approaching a point of industrial policy, aren't we, right now? Yeah, I think that's entirely fair, David. The, the growth in industrial policy, in particular the growth of arbitrary executive orders from the president, and that goes back to W. Bush, to Obama, and especially Trump. It's a good scale back some under Biden. But the ability to do executive orders, the ability to choose winners, the ability to reallocate money. And I think on a very political basis, I think that's all been going up. And this hasn't been paying off. We, we have a number of people out there writing that the US needs more of an industrial policy. Brian Deese, the head of the National Economic Council, I believe, has given some speeches to this effect. And I think, frankly, um, it, most of the things under that label are going to be at best waste of money and at worst going to divert the U.S. from dealing with some of its bigger problems. The infrastructure bill we were talking about before the break is far more positive than an industrial policy. So, Adam, finally, uh, I wonder uh, what the United States can do to have this competition that President Biden has set up as a competition between democracies and autocracies. And to a significant degree, he's talking about the United States versus China, two different systems, actually, of governing ourselves. What do we need to do to be more competitive if that is a competition? I think, as our mutual friend Evan Greenberg has said several times, you want to run your own race. Uh, this is a different way of putting what I was saying about letting the rope and dope strategy letting China tire itself out. In the end, the competition is mostly one, if one does get into one's own head and one does one's own training and prep. I mean, from reading sports pages for 50 years, that's what I've learned. And that's in the sense where the U.S. has to be looking. Now, Biden seems to be partly sincerely and partly tactically trying to psych up the U.S. to compete harder by making the opponent seem scary. But I, I, I'm not sure that's an effective way to train or an effective way to compete. What you really need to do is compete against yourself. And that's where the US has been failing.
Yeah, I always said back at ABC News, you, you want to play it as a game of golf, not tennis. You're playing the course, you're not playing the other person. Thank you so much, Adam. It's always a treat, as I say, to have you with us. That's the president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Coming up, changing the way Medicare treats diabetes. It's given a big boost today to our stock of the hour, mankind. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Mankind is our stock of the hour after it got a boost from a change in Medicare that's expected to help the sale of glucose monitors. Our stocks editor, Dave Wilson, is here with the story. Dave? Well, we're talking about a company that's really the legacy of Alfred Mann. That's why it's Mankind with two Ns. He died uh, at the age of 90 back in 2016, but their initial product was uh, an inhaled form of insulin called a Frezza that uh, U.S. regulators approved back in 2014. The challenge, though, for this company has been getting Medicare to pay for it. If you're a diabetes patient, you had to make a choice. Either you could get a continuous glucose monitor or you could get a Frezza. Well, now that choice has gone away. In other words, as of next month, diabetes patients will be able to choose a Frezza even if they have glucose monitors and Medicare will pay for it. So, you know, that is a big deal for this company, especially because it hasn't been profitable over time. Analysts are expecting earnings out in 2023. So anything they can do to get closer to profitability is to the good for mankind. It's interesting, Dave, that actually that much of their business would be dependent on Medicare. Well, but it's not unusual for smaller drug companies. And when we say smaller, here's some context. The company's had sales of $360 million since it began with Afreza back in 2016. You put that up against the biggest selling diabetes drugs, and you are talking billions of dollars a year. So it just goes to show you, you know, how important it is for this company to get the Medicare approval, and analysts certainly expect a lot out of it because you know, they're basically saying, buy this stock. You got to have the revenue and the earnings to justify that. Not to speak of the patients who would rather inhale the insulin than get a shot. Thank you so much to Dave Wilson for the report on mankind. Coming up, Myron Brilliant of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on doing business with China under the Biden administration. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The brutal heat wave that's already brought record temperatures to the U.S. Northwest is set to grow even more extreme today and last for the rest of the week. Parts of Seattle, which had its warmest day ever on Sunday with a high of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, could hit 111 today. Forecasters say Portland could top 114. The weather frying the Northwest also poured heavy rain across central states and will bring a heat wave to the New York area and the Northeast. The U.S. Supreme Court refused today to question the rights of transgender students to use school bathrooms that correspond with their gender identity. The justices rejected an appeal by a Virginia school board in a long-running civil rights battle. The rebuff seals a legal victory for Gavin Grimm, who was a high school student in 2014 when his school district barred him from continuing to use the boys' restrooms. England is very likely to see the end of pandemic restrictions on July 19th. That word today from Prime Minister Boris Johnson, despite a surge in infections of the new Delta variant. The Prime Minister says hospitalization and death rates remain relatively low, but that it would be sensible to take a few more weeks to analyze the infection patterns and deliver more second vaccine doses before lifting the curbs. With every day that goes by, it's clearer to, to me and to all our advisors, all our scientific advisors, that uh, we're very likely to be in a, in a position on July the 19th to say that that really is the, the terminus and we can uh, go back to uh, life as it was before COVID as far as possible. 
While many bosses welcome Johnson's upbeat assessment, others are skeptical after plans to uh, limit the uh, to set to lift the limits on social gatherings were delayed by a month. Sweden's prime minister is resigning after losing a confidence vote last week. Stefan Löfven, who has been premier since 2014, is the first Swedish leader ever to lose a confidence vote in parliament. He didn't call for an early election as the Swedish constitution allows him to. Löfven is formally stepping down, but will continue in a caretaker role until a new government can be formed. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. The Chinese Communist Party celebrates its 100th anniversary this week with all the pageantry and pomp you might expect. And the one thing that cannot be denied is the economic progress that it has made. For a view of the current state of U.S. companies doing business with China today and where it all may be headed tomorrow, we welcome now Myron Brilliant. He's executive vice president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where he is head of international affairs. Thank you so much for being back with us, Myron. Great to see you. Give us your sense of where U.S. doing business in China is right now under the Biden administration. Well, David, it's great to be back on. I would say that there is a caution just in the air. There is a lot of unresolved issues, policy issues between the two governments. The business community is certainly caught up in that. We're still hoping to see where the comprehensive review within the administration will be lead it on trade policy with China. Are we going to tackle the phase one outstanding obligations of the Chinese government? Are we going to go further seeking structural reforms in areas like subsidies? Uh, transfer of technology, intellectual property, dealing with cybersecurity and data issues. And while we applaud the administration's efforts, first to focus on the domestic market, build back our infrastructure, currently take care of our own citizens, and deal with uh, building up multilateral relations with the Europeans, President Biden had the largest successful trip. There's still a lot of unknowns in the U.S.-China relationship, and that remains the top priority for business leaders. And not all of them, as you know so well, Myron, are directly related to business or commerce. I mean, we've got issues with the Uyghur people out in the West. We've got issues with Hong Kong. We have sanctions, even some of the sanctions imposed just last week. Is it possible for the Biden administration to pursue a constructive, engaged commercial relationship with China and still pursue some of the other issues, the values issues that it has put on the table? Well, David, all those issues you just listed are issues that touch upon us. Clearly, uh, we condemn uh, forced labor, and we have been very clear about that. Clearly, we're very concerned about the new national security law that's been in place in Hong Kong. We think it's a chilling of civil liberties. Businesses have not fled, but certainly uh, business institutions, financial institutions, have uncertainty in, in terms of compliance with local regulations that might be in face of other regulations in the United States or elsewhere. So we're caught up in all these issues. And until the framework uh, for U.S.-China relations is put out there, until we know who's the point in the administration, until we know what kind of dialogues are going to take place, there's a lot of uncertainty. We're going to navigate through that. Businesses are not going to ignore a market of 1.4 customers, 1.4 billion customers in China. On the other hand, certainly supply chains are being impacted by recent developments and many other issues. So a lot of uncertainty. We still see some continuity in policy from the previous administration, but until we have the constructive high-level dialogues that might lead to a summit this fall at the G20 meeting between President Biden and Xi Jinping, we just don't have the certainty that this is great. So, so Myron, as you put it, as far as I can tell, the, the review is still going on with the Biden administration. So they don't know what their position is, and they can't meet with the other side until they know what their position is so they can express it. So what's the timeline on this? Well, I think the administration wanted to, to come at it from a position of strength, right? Get some domestic priorities done, talk to the allies in Europe and, of course, in Asia, like Japan and Singapore and Australia, and get aligned on the principles of how to engage China's unfair trade practices. And they're trying to do that. And we've seen some success uh, in the meetings around the G7 and, of course, in the EU-US uh, dialogue. But that said, you cannot replace that with U.S.-China direct dialogues that are results-oriented. We don't want dialogue for the sake of dialogue. We want results in the dialogue, and we want to hold China accountable for their phase one deal that they negotiated and go well beyond that and deal with structural issues that were not addressed 
in the phase one deal, whether it's dealing with data or forced technology transfer or areas like intellectual property, there are still many outstanding issues that have to be addressed. So yes, uh, the review has been moving very slowly. I will see uh, Ambassador Tai in a few minutes and have a conversation with her, bring other business leaders in, into that conversation. And I'm gonna press her as I have White House officials about getting that dialogue out and about so that we can engage effectively our own government in the path forward. Myron, what about more broadly, uh, the Biden administration approach to trade policy? Uh, how much progress have they made in really fleshing it in so that we know where we stand? Well, we applaud the effort to remove the irritant between Europe and the United States, right? Getting rid of the Airbus Boeing dispute was a good move. Their signs are going to try to reduce the struggles around the 232 uh, steel aluminum tariffs. It haven't been done yet, but hopefully that would be helpful both to Europe and the United States and elsewhere. There's a huge burden uh, for counter retaliation uh, tariffs in areas that are affecting our farmers, affecting our manufacturers. So removing that would be helpful. But that's not enough. We need a robust trade agenda. What happened to the outstanding FTA negotiations? with the United Kingdom and with Kenya. There was very little coming out of the Biden and Boris Johnson discussions around the free trade agreement. Negotiations have been ongoing, we're very close. That should be a very pivotal agreement. There are other areas also that we need to probe, uh, whether we can move forward with some kind of deal with India. And there are other opportunities, uh, there are huge markets out there. And remember, uh, China has closed a deal uh, in its own backyard, the reset deal, and also there's the transatlantic, the trans-Pacific partnership deal that the United States is not a partner in. So what are we going to do in the Asia-Pacific region, which is the home of the most dynamic economies in the world? We need to be a partner of that eventually. So we need a much more robust trade agenda uh, than we have to date, and I hope we'll hear more about that uh, in the coming weeks. And I hope you'll come back and tell us all about it, because there's a lot on that list that you set out. Thank you so much. Great to have you back with us. It's Myron Brilliant. He's U.S. Chamber of Commerce Executive Vice President. Coming up, we talk about the U.S. strikes on Iranian bases in Syria and Iraq with retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Those indirect talks in Vienna over the Iran nuclear deal continue, even as Iran gets ready for a new president. And the U.S. has hit now overnight Iranian bases located in Syria and Iraq. To bring us up to date on the Iranian talks, welcome now the newest member of our Washington team. She is Anne-Marie Hordern. So first of all, most important, welcome, Anne-Marie. It's great to have you Thanks, there. Thanks, you, you know this subject so terribly well with the negotiations. Tell us where those stand, because I lose track from time to time. They've been sort of doing yeah. it forever. Yeah, well, at the moment, David, they're just really in a standstill. And I think the risk right now, especially following these uh, latest attacks, is that the risk is that they just kind of remain in a standstill or potentially even go backwards. Uh, potentially, we could see diplomats again start to, to have these negotiations as soon as this week, but there's no date yet. Uh, the other thing we need to keep in mind, and you mentioned there, is that there's this new government that will be coming into power, led by Ibrahim Raisi in August. But also, the Iranians have yet to extend that detailed monetary uh, monitoring pact with the IAEA. Now, I spoke with the uh, director general of the IAEA last week, Rafael Grossi, and he said right before the deadline was about to hit that the Iranians have not contacted them to extend it. So right now, uh, what the Iranians could do potentially is either extend that pact, which would give a little bit of breathing room to these diplomatic talks, or, David, what would be something that could really, I think, derail the talks is if the Iranians were to delete all that data that the IAEA has on the enrichment of uranium in certain sites. And really, this was one of the paramount and key sticking figures of the 2015 JCPOA deal. Okay, thank you so much, Anne-Marie Hordern. And once again, welcome to Washington. It's great to have you there. Staying on the subject of Iran and the region, we welcome now retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, who served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and as Assistant Secretary of State under President George W. Bush. So, Mark, thank you so much for being back with us. Talk about these strikes. What was the tactical or strategic significance of them? Well, I think the main uh, 
issue was the fact that these Iranian proxy groups have attacked American interests inside of Iraq 10 times since the beginning of the year. I'm surprised that this administration has shown such temper during this time period that they've held back on these strikes. But I just think that uh, there is a clear message being sent, one of deterrence and also one that says, if you keep this up, we're going to go on offense. Well, so uh, one of the things I was surprised at, I must confess, is that th these uh, militia groups that are backed by Iran actually have drones that are armed drones. Part of the hit here was against that. How dangerous is that for our interests? Well, we've seen these uh, attack our interests, whether it's the bases out in the center of uh, the desert or up in Erbil, or for that matter, inside of Baghdad. Uh, but they aren't their drones, they're Iranian drones. I mean, there's, there's no clear evidence uh, at looking at the technology they have and the markings that they have that these things might have well just say made in Iran. So this is a proxy battle that's being fought by Iran against Americans inside of Iraq. Uh, is this going to uh, put a wrench in the works of the negotiations with Iran? Or sometimes in the past you've said it's actually part of the negotiation. Well, I don't think it's part of the negotiation. I think it's uh, part of the hybrid warfare that we've been conducting uh, against each other since 79. Look, the ultimate campaign of the Iranians is to get the Americans out and make the Gulf region a uh, basically under their hegemony. How are they going to do that? They're going to use all of what we call hybrid warfare techniques, whether it's proxy war, whether it's negotiations, cyber attacks, disinformation. So you can't separate the negotiations from this overall hybrid warfare campaign that they're fighting with us. That's not meant to be saber rattling. It's just their technique of fighting, whether it's using proxies in Iraq or uh, using hybrid uh, uh, cyber attacks against us in our critical infrastructure. All of this is leading to a desire for the Iranians to push the Americans out of the Gulf and extend their hegemony over the Gulf. And finally, Mark, Afghanistan, that we talked about quite a few times before, we're about to be entirely out of Afghanistan. What are the consequences? Well, first of all, I don't think we're going to be entirely out of Afghanistan. Uh, we'll probably leave about 600 troops in there to provide enabling capabilities such as intelligence and air support. The Turks have already volunteered to take over Kabul airport. And I think it's important to remind everybody that uh, we basically pushed the Taliban out of Kabul with less than 600 troops in, in 2001. Mm -hmm. It does require a military that will fight alongside of us. We will provide the capabilities. They have to provide the will. But I think the real question is, are the Afghanis willing to fight uh, when there are no significant numbers of American forces on the ground, even though we're providing intelligence, air support, and other capabilities? It's you, up to them. Do you have a view on that? Do you think they are likely to, or is it just an open question? Yeah, I was uh, talking to Abdullah Abdullah uh, about a week and a half ago. He truly believes that the military has the capability to hold back any type of Taliban uh, attack. However, he, like me, is concerned about whether the military is willing to fight uh, the way that they need to to push back the advances of the Taliban. So it's really up to them. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. It's always great to have you with us. That's retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. More Balance of Power is coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. ESG investing is all the rage as regulators move toward required disclosure. And the ExxonMobil board got a makeover demanded by an activist shareholder group. For Wall Street Week Friday evening, we talked with Barbara Ann Bernard of Wincrest Capital and with Chris Aylman of Calsters about their different approaches to ESG investing. And we began by asking Chris about his backing of those that group of dissidents in the ExxonMobil context. Test. We have been uh, having uh, engagement and dialogue with the integrated oil companies for several years now because we're really concerned about the future and the, and it's going to be a lower carbon and these companies have to change and adjust. ExxonMobil has just been recalcitrant. They have just ignored shareholders for several years. Uh, New York Common made a run at them, um, New York City, CalPERS, and they just rebuffed everybody. Uh, we felt that it's time to change uh, at the top. 
Uh, when Engine One approached us and said they're going to propose a, a alternative slate for a board, uh, we said we would get behind them. So when they announced in December, we came out the same day endorsing their uh, slate, uh, and that was intentional. And we worked behind that, uh, uh, supporting their effort. We weren't proxy solicitors. What we were doing was really just calling our huge network of institutional investors in all the groups and raising this and making them aware. Uh, and I think in the end, it was Exxon's own actions of adding board members, suddenly talking about carbon sequestration. They really changed their tune because they realized that shareholders were unhappy and were frustrated. Uh, and look at that stock chart. It really turned around. Now, all the integrated oils have come up, but look at Exxon relative to the others. And I think the fact that we were finally engaging with them and making some traction with management was waking uh, the shareholders up and they cared. Uh, and it was a huge move. So I think the the announcement that we saw that we elected three, they elected three board members onto the Exxon Mobil board is dramatic. And it really is going to signal a change from the top. Now their hard work begins. I don't want Exxon Mobil to become a Kodak, uh, a blockbuster uh, video store, or I'll go back in my time, a warehouse record store. We want to see Exxon Mobil actually exist 20 and 30 years from now, but they've got to change and adapt to be able to do that. They can't just stick their head in, in oil and gas only. And I know we've received criticism of that because that's their main calling, but they can adapt and they can adjust and have a become an energy company. Uh, and we're going to need hydrocarbons into the future. Uh, but we're not going to necessarily need to burn them. We're going to use them for lubricants and other things. So they've got a product mix. They've got a very solid company. They have good research. I'm optimistic with a new fresh board at the top and a change of tone at the top that this company can, can adjust and adapt into the future and survive, as we're seeing with all the major oils having to do, to recognize the future is lower and lower carbon emissions. Barbara, and what about it? You're an expert in ESG investing and something, I think of an enthusiast for it. Is it enough to adapt or do we need to start taking the carbon out of the atmosphere, just not putting quite as much into it? So, Chris, what I think you did was great. And if you can change their capital allocations decisions and save your investment, good on you. That is phenomenal. But what happened this week with the launch of another index tracking ETF, I don't think is the answer. There is no energy transition without an investor transition. So ESG 1.0 was by the index and slightly overweight tech and underweight oil and gas and charge a premium for it. So we've gone from passive ESG to what I would now call passive aggressive ESG with engine 1.0. And while it's good and I hope, you know, I, I wish them, I wish them well, I think ESG 2.0 is not engine number one. ESG 2.0 is the little engine that could. And the little engine that could invest in the renewables and the copper and nickel and lithium mines that are mining in sustainable ways that are going to drive this transition. It's investing in the ESG leaders who are decarbonizing and, and are disrupting their models because we do need, as Chris says, their services, but we need them with less carbon. So I don't think ESG 2.0 is about the index at all. I think it's about decarbonization and it takes investment, not divestment. That, that was part of my conversation with Barbara Ann Bernard of Windcrest Capital and Chris Ailman of Calsters on Wall Street Week on Friday. And as you heard, two different approaches, one passive or as Barbara Ann said, passive aggressive. The other is much more activist. That's to ESG investing. Coming up here, Balance of Power is going to continue on Bloomberg Radio. And in our second hour, we're going to talk to Middle East envoy and expert Dennis Ross, U.S.-Israeli relations on the day. Secretary of State Blinken meets with his Israeli counterpart in Rome. We will also talk with Republican Congress from Ohio, Warren Davidson, about the alternatives on infrastructure as well as his work on credit disclosure. That's coming up in the second hour of Balance of Power. Right now, we're on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio.